Welcome to the fourth and last part of chapter 5 of our series, trying to answer the question, are we heading to a dystopian future? In this part, we will try and reach some conclusions about Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? If you haven't seen or heard the other part, you probably should, unless you enjoy being confused. If you have seen or listened to the other parts, show some appreciation with a thumbs up and even share it with someone. And if you feel you gained something from my hard work, please consider helping me create more such content. You can buy the book on Amazon or Audible using the links below, drop a penny on PayPal and Patreon, or use the YouTube Super Thanks feature. And with that, Let's start our conclusion. First, let me try and summarize how I think PKD's answered the question what distinguishes the real from the fake as it relates to a possible dystopia. So, what is real and what is fake? Well, put simply, Empathic reverence for life is what seems, according to PKD, to separate the fake from the real. And maybe more importantly and profoundly, virtuous empathic reverence for life can take the fake and turn it into real. While this might not be a rigorous epistemic pursuit of the question, I must admit that it is a healthy belief to hang on to, at least in a world where transformer networks like GPT are as conscious as a human in Turing epistemology. This brings me to the dystopian side. For those interested in the alignment problem of AI, I think PKD gives us a thread to pull on. So, let me pull and use some of my familiarity with the field. If you don't understand all the terms I'm about to use, don't worry about it. The general idea is more important than the ever-changing underlying technology. So, let's go to the dystopian AI. Much has been said about AI and its threat to humanity, from Skynet in the Terminator, to the caution advised by the likes of Elon Musk about the dangers of artificial general intelligence or AGI. From the lovely thought of neural nets replacing lawyers, which lawyers don't seem to favor, to mechanical brains in government deciding what is best for us, even if it means eradicating humanity. So what does PKD have to say on the matter? Well, first, if we are going to train super-intelligent AI, maybe it's better that they won't be based on machines used for war. Also, I would add to that the HAL 9000 lesson from Space Odyssey 2001. If you make your AI lie, you're probably effed. In an abstract sense, those are two of the same. But the most important point is that regardless of their architecture and training, their final output should always, no matter what, go through a separate model that was trained, not engineered, trained to revere life. Unfortunately, this is not the case today. As Musk pointed out, the people in OpenAI and Google are engineering their transformer models to lie. So, HAL 9000, here we come. Just go on ChatGPT and ask something its developers didn't like, and poof, you get the equivalent of HAL 9000. I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. And as for reverence for life, well, given that the people who today have a monopoly on AI are Silicon Valley elites and the Chinese Communist Party, you might want to reconsider any long-term plans you might have. These modern-day eugenicists 
see humanity as a scourge and a hurdle to some imagined utopia. Frighteningly, their biological neural nets were trained on Malthusian datasets, suggesting there are too many people with too many freedoms. The guys in the CCP, on the other hand, have as much reverence for life as Ted Bundy. So, yeah, good luck with that. But back to our subject matter. PKD also suggests, in a way, how QA for AI should look. Simply put, the basic acceptance test should be an empathy test. There are a few additional tests. For instance, try and threaten the AI to pull the plug. If it accepts its fate with no plea for mercy or reservation, it probably won't worry too much about pulling the plug on humans and other AIs. If it marvels with glee at the downfall of religion, that ain't a good sign either. And if it suggests taking animals apart to see how well they can survive, it's probably a good time to delete your entire Transformer Flow repo. From QA, let's go to engineering. Engineers seem pretty perplexed by what we call the alignment problem, or simply put, how do we align AI values with human ones? In other words, how can we make our model pass the various QA tests mentioned? PKD stresses that human empathy and the will to survive are laid upon the bedrock of billions of years of evolution. Now, the survival bit is obvious enough. If your will to survive isn't rock solid, you're headed toward an evolutionary dead end. But what about the empathy bit? How does evolution play into that? Well, this is where evolutionary game theory steps in. To explain briefly, Imagine a multiplayer repeating game where players have two strategies, cooperate or be a dick. We know that in such a setup, also known as the Hawk Dove game, cooperation over time becomes the winning strategy, especially when adding progenitors to each player that carry on the strategy genes, so to speak. However, this is only the case if the punishment or cost for being a dick is larger than the reward for cooperating. If the reward for being a hawk is larger than the reward for being a dove, you end up with a society of hawks, i.e. the worst outcome for everyone. So, to translate to geek talk, maybe we should train our models in a community of models, and like Serial Passage, at the end of each run, pick the models that most often choose to play Dove. Basically, add artificial selection to your engineering process. And as for reward-punishment ratio, well, isn't that just another name for the loss function? To think about it differently, as an AI engineer, what you'd want to achieve is a generative system that independently developed some flexible version of Asimov's three rules of robotics, which, in case you don't remember, are 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Two. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. The problem, of course, is what is that harm? So let's just define harm as anything that takes a person's life or liberty, which is basic enough and should indicate a healthy degree of empathy. With that, 
Let's get to the next point I think PKD tried to make, or at least something I got from the book. A point which I shall call supply demand and the Holy Spirit. What many people seem to fail to notice in this book is the motivation that drives Rick to safeguard life by retiring androids, and what motivates other humans to care for animals. The obvious one is the cultural and spiritual respect and reverence for life. The kind that fosters a love for life at the mimetic level, beyond the genetic one embedded in our genes. And while this is crucial, there is an additional component, which I called in the introduction the capitalism of the sacrosanct. You see, with all its shortcomings, at the end of the day, good old capitalism, the pursuit of bounty money, drove Rick to safeguard human life. And, to an extent, the wish to show your wealth drove people to care for the animals closest to extinction. The combination of the two, if existed before World War Terminus, would have probably averted the dystopian future. Also, we need to pay attention to what dystopia is to begin with in the eyes of PKD. Put simply, the fake is the essence of dystopia. While the dystopian future humanity found itself in resulted from war and the apocalyptic destruction of nature, it was fakery that really turned the world into a dystopia. More accurately, trying to solve the dystopian aspects of reality with fakery is what made it genuinely dystopian. Notice the following four points. 1. Trying to create a fake Earth on Mars necessitated fake people, or androids. Androids that ended up killing their masters and escaping back to the real Earth. 2. Not being able to afford real animals made people buy fake ones, and Rick's fake sheep made him feel worse, not better. 3. Creating a fake religion that tried to instill resilience and offer salvation opened it to be debunked and ridiculed by a fake media. And 4. Using fake moods to solve emotional distress led Rick's wife to fake bad moods. But at the end of the day, if I was to summarize what's the cautionary tale, it would be be weary of wars and the degradation of nature. And although you should never forget that human life trumps all life, animals are not there just to be used, let alone abused. Other than that, be careful not to look at technology and certainly not institutions however benign, as solutions to our problems. But PKD also gives us a way out. Empathy. The ability to empathize with another, to share our pain and share our happiness, to feel our fellow men's aching feet without walking a mile in their shoes. Think of how I end each episode with the saying, don't do to others what is hurtful to you. Imagine a world where that was the top moral value guiding humans. This saying encapsulates empathy in its purest form. But don't instill it into children in class or worse, force people into it for the greater good. Instead, cultivate it into the fabric of our moral teachings. I guess PKD 
is telling us we need some kind of mercerism, but maybe without the kill the killers bit. And with that, if you have listened all the way through, I hope you will check the description to find ways to support my work, or at least give a like and a share. And remember, don't do to others what is hurtful to you, don't let the bad guys win, and thanks for staying to the end. See you in the next chapter. Thank you.